Thank you so much for that introduction, Abby, and thank you so much for inviting me and uh, for your time and attention during this busy midterm time of year. So yes, first to um, just get us started, I am, I'll show you the title slide here, and then I have a quick uh, check-in to get to know each other. So uh, this talk will be about why open? open education opportunities and the research evidence for them. And I'd like you to start off by letting me know a little bit about you. So if you could go to menti.com and use this code, uh, the first two slides to fill out. So the first one is what is your position? Just so I can get to know a little bit about you. Okay. And just can I confirm, for some reason, I don't have the green outline showing that I'm sharing my screen. Am I sharing the screen showing the Mentimeter? Yes. Okay. Normally, it gives me a reassuring green frame, so I know I am. All right. So instructors and faculty. Got one student. All right. And then the next question. Uh, if you could indicate your level of agreement on here. So this should be, you know, over on the left is strongly disagree. And then on the right, my right anyway, is strongly agree. And then the middle would be more neutral. If I could get folks to fill this out, just so I know what to, uh, what points to belabor on. <laughs> All right, so we got a mix of backgrounds, a lot of use, some familiarity with Creative Commons, not so much about renewable assignments and not so much about the research. So hopefully I can cover the uh, those three points with a, um, less agreement today in a way to make those points clear. So here is the agenda I put together for our time together today. First, uh, what makes open education different? So how is it different than commercial education? And then I, I say, come for the finances, stay for the pedagogy. So I'm going to talk about the financial benefits. And, you know, that's what lured me in. And then I well, after I was hooked, so to speak, I got into the pedagogical changes I could make. I'll talk about the SCOPE framework, which is a new emerging framework that uh, my colleagues and I have just proposed on research. Talk about revising textbooks and then renewable assignments. Um, and I'll do my best to make sure I have time to answer questions. It's not a super huge crowd, so... Um, Abby, if you know if you could do me a favor and monitor the chat and just let me know as uh, folks have um, points that they want clarification on so I can go back and do that. All right, first of all, what makes open open is the licensing. Uh, a lot of times there's the assumption that license the open educational resources just mean that they're free, but that's not quite it. Open education means that there's open licensing on the materials and the resources. Open licensing is usually Creative Commons. Um, and in this chart on the right, I have the different designations for Creative Commons licensing. The least restrictive is attribution. Um, and then the most would be to have uh, no commercial, no derivative works. Um, which means you can share it and use it, but you can't make, you, you can't commercialize them, which is something I always put on my materials. Um, I always do buy and not commercial on my materials, um, but no derivatives mean you're not allowed to change them. You can't legally edit them. So most open resources do not um, have no derivative on it. Most open resources allow for editing, and that's really the beauty of them that I'm going to go into today. Uh, but the variations of open resources 
not only allows for sharing without access fees, but also allows for revising and redistributing. So you can change them and then you can share them again. And I'm gonna talk a lot about um, the pedagogy of open, but I don't wanna overlook look the importance that the financial cost savings do matter. Our students are under a lot of financial burdens. Commercial materials are often expensive. I have two stepchildren in college that I get text messages from, from the bookstore saying, what's this? Why do I have to have it? Can you help me? And I, I do my best as a professor to get them access to the um, uh, free online copies. Hopefully they're not listening that I can you that I can have access to. But there's some things I know my stepson dropped a class because of the cost of the materials. Uh, and you know my stepchildren are are technically historically underserved group groups. They're both biracial students of color, and their their mother is an immigrant. So you know this is an example of how it's burdensome for some students, especially underserved groups. You know we found that it, it causes a lot of problems in terms of not just having financial consequences, but also dropping courses, not doing as well in a course or withdrawing from a course, which is more expensive in the long run. But in the immediate, if you do not have the money for materials, you often will need to drop a class. Uh, at the time spent looking for cheaper materials is also an issue. Students are pretty savvy. They found a lot of ways to save money. But that those ways of like hunting different bookstores, looking on different websites, saving, sharing materials with friends, you know, my case, my stepkids, you know, texting me with, you know, asking questions that all takes time that they're spending on commercial materials and the stress due to costs. Uh, and we found that this stress does tend to be higher for historically underserved groups. So first generation college students, especially because they don't have a parent they can talk to saying, how can I save money on this? Uh, but open is more than free. So free means there's no cost, which is great for those reasons I just talked about. Open means though that you have what are called the five R permissions. And we're gonna talk a bit today about how those different permissions can be applied and incorporated into not just materials, uh, but the pedagogy, the actual um, activities that students engage in. And before we talk about open pedagogy and open education and how it relates to pedagogy, we do need to understand how we got there. We wouldn't be here talking about open education without the scholarship of important educational theorists who work to break down barriers specific to the white supremacist educational systems. An emancipatory approach to education is heavily re represented in the, book, in the works of Paulo Freire, Bell Hooks, Iris Schoer, and Henry Giroux and Peter McLaurin. These are all innovative approaches to education which have been successful in practice. So this is built so that what I'm gonna be talking about today has its roots way before open, You know, talking about emancipatory pedagogy, democratic pedagogy, having a negotiated curriculum in which students and instructors engage in a true dialogue of interaction and collaboration. This is one, this is a term coined originally by David Wiley. It is, sorry. Oh no, not my internet connection. I just got a, one of those dreaded your internet connection is unstable. I'm on campus. This shouldn't be an issue. Anyway, he describes a disposable assignment as one where students do the work, faculty grade the work, and then students throw it away. And nobody outside of the students, the student and the faculty sees it. Maybe, you know, in a more active learning situation, you have some peer review or collaboration so the other peers see it. But for the most part, it, it's just evidence of learning. Um, it doesn't uh, create any value outside of the course. So David Wiley argued that we ditch the disposable assignment and take on what's known as the renewable assignment. 
what's a renewable assignment? It's one where the first two steps are the same. The students do work, faculty grade the work, but the work has value beyond the class. And it can be openly published uh, and Creatively Commons licensed so that other people can find it and use it. It has, it becomes an open educational resource of its own. And I have a picture here of the Open Pedagogy Notebook where there's a repository of different ideas. I also am later on gonna show you a faculty guide to um, renewable assignments and open pedagogy uh, with the, the clarification that when I talk about renewable assignments and open pedagogy, they're very much the same thing. The whole idea is that you are having students in the process of editing, revising, or creating works that are renewable, used again. So as when open education first came to be, the big focus was on advocacy. How does it affect grades? How does it affect course enrollment? Uh, however, we've broadened as a field and we're much more focused on pedagogy and social justice. So because of these advancements, my colleagues and I, uh, Jasmine Roberts-Cruz and Lindsay Gavosh, have proposed what we call the SCOPE framework. This SCOPE framework encompasses social justice, cost, outcomes, perspectives, and engagement. It leads off with social justice because commitment to inclusion and equity is fundamental to the ethos of open education. And we wanted to have it be at the beginning and have it be explicit because oftentimes when we talk about open education traditionally, there's an assumption of our motivation being social justice, but we don't say it. We don't explicitly have our inquiry based on it. Cost refers to the loss assumed to either be due to or avoided by open education. So traditionally we've looked at cost in terms of finances. In the scope framework, we, we suggest looking at things like emotions, time, cognitive effort, and social political costs. Outcomes refer to presume effects due to open education, namely academic outcomes. We call for more inquiry into groups historically underserved and in K-12. Uh, perceptions are impressions and opinions of open education, and engagement refers to fully participating and being actively involved in open education. So we have uh, followed Sarah Lambert's framework of social justice in education um, to think about how open education and social justice are related. And if you look at this framework here, so redistributive justice is the concept that um, people who have been historically denied resources have access to them. Uh, recognitive justice is being able to see yourself in the materials and in the course in, in terms of the variety of identities that people have. And representational justice justice is the opportunity to express your opinions and tell the story you have and to, to speak from your unique voice and identities. And first I'm going to talk about how open education addresses redistributed justice. So this is the people who have been historically denied access are able to have access. And we know that students are, who have been historically underserved are more adversely affected by expensive commercial materials. Uh, we also know that we found that course grades tend to be similar, uh, but withdrawal rates are lower with open educational resources. So this is providing more access to education. We've also found when thinking specifically about those underserved groups that we need to be reaching, if we look at first generation and low income college students, you see more of a benefit. Uh, and this would be argued to be part of uh, how open education affects redistributive justice. All right, but open education is more than just free. 
and going back to some, you know, those five R's, being able to revise and redistribute and retain, um, how do those matter to social justice? How do those pertain to those issues in the scope framework I mentioned? Well, first, let's talk about recognitive justice. So if you look at textbooks in general and the studies thus far that I know of have been specific to textbooks, I know there's a variety of course materials beyond textbooks, but we know that there isn't diverse representation. Um, and the issue isn't unique to commercial textbooks. We see a lack of diverse representation in open textbooks as well. Uh, however, what makes open educational resources different is that you can edit them. So you are able to fix your textbooks in terms of how they lack in diversity. And then providing that increased visibility of identities is thought to lead to more recognition and greater recognitive justice. So I'm gonna show some examples of particularly problematic content in commercial textbooks. And what makes this content really, really problematic is you can't remove it. So this is a world ge geography textbook. This is a K through 12 material. And it's an example of using really biased language um, when talking about enslaved people's experience. They were not workers who were brought, they were captured and imprisoned and enslaved. Here is a um, screenshot, I apologize, it's a little bit blurry, but I had a nursing professor actually bring this to my attention. I was just shocked. This only came out a few years ago and it claims to be promoting diversity and cultural knowledge, but what it really is promoting is stereotypes. It's uh, quite awful actually how much this refers to stereotypes and is intentionally teaching future nurses to have these biases. Here's another example uh, that I learned about through a marketing professor is a terminology that was used in a marketing textbook um, using tribal terminology in situations that don't relate to actual Native American tribes. These terms are considered biased and problematic and exclusionary because a tribe has a very specific, very important meaning in um, Native American cultures. So both open and commercial materials lack this diversity, but having that licensing that allows for revising and redistributing, if you have an open textbook with problematic content, you can legally go in and remove it and change it in a way that you are simply unable to with commercial content with a closed copyright. And this can be done just by the instructor. You know, if you wanna go through and just remove things or change things before your students even see them, or you can actually have it be a course assignment to work through collaboratively to edit the textbook. And Having students collaborate to edit a textbook would be an example of a renewable assignment or open pedagogy. So I'm gonna start off by showing this um, link to resources. I put together um, multiple examples or instantiations of renewable assignments and open pedagogy. I, I have, um, I put this together a couple of years ago and I've been updating it every few months or so with new research that comes out or new examples that come out. Um, so not only does it describe the open pedagogy, it gives you a link to the directions for the assignment. Um, if there is applicable research evidence, I have it cited there and I have it linked in there as well. So uh, this is licensed for free sharing and distribution, um, you are welcome to download and um, revise and redistribute with your adding on your own information as well. So the, 
I want to go into, um, before I begin on, uh, before I begin by going into the variety of open assignments and open pedagogy, I want to talk about this uh, saying that can kind of help think about things. First of all, open pedagogy doesn't have to take a single form or it doesn't rely on a specific tool. It is not a one size fits all approach. So um, we're gonna use language from the open science realm in that scene that we want things to be as open as possible, as closed as ne necessary when we're doing open assignments. Uh, you should be intentional about what your values are and thinking about whether or not it makes sense to have students have the opportunity to, to uh, share and distribute their work from the class. So, I mean, as an example of an assignment that is necessary to keep closed, the students in my child development class conduct observations of real children on a campus, and then they write up a case study about them where they integrate the course content with their observations of the children. Because these are actual children and this would be considered research to a certain extent if it was shared outside of the course, uh, and these are um, these, this is a first year course, so students haven't had a lot of experience with things like research ethics and all of that that are outside of the uh, learning objectives for the course. It just doesn't make it make sense to have this be shared. But I have my students in that same course working on vignettes of fictional children. So these are children I had them make up out of the air, um, you know, starting off with a concept map where they would make up like, okay, what's your child's name? What's their favorite color? How old they are? Uh, and then I had them think about a psychological disorder that they were interested in learning more about and then um, write about how the child uh, has this psychological disorder and how it affects their day-to-day -day life. Those assignments are gonna be open. They're fictional. Um, my students are not gonna be required to share them, but that's an example where students have the opportunity to share things um, in a way that uh, allows for it to be as open as possible. So on to, I'm not sure why it's not. Uh, one of my favorite things to do, open education research. And I'm going to start off by talking about a study where we looked at multiple instantiations of renewable assignments. So Lindsay Gavash uh, from the New England Board of Higher Education invited me onto this project. And she mentored eight faculty members in a community of practice to convert an existing assignment into a renewable assignment. So rather than starting from scratch, they thought about something that they already have had students do and had them think about how they could make it into shareable and um, redistributable. And uh, some examples. So every faculty member had a different assignment. They came from a range of backgrounds, mathematics, history, social work, um, criminal justice, and they had students make websites, they had them create brochures for local organizations, they had them transcribe historical works, quite a few different things. The students in these courses were encouraged but not required to use Creative Commons licensing uh, to publicly share their work for reuse. Uh, in other words, they had the option to have it be shared outside of the class. And then we created a survey and asked students to talk about their experiences with renewable assignments compared to their experiences with more traditional assignments, such as uh, exams and quizzes or papers that they write that uh, they never use again after the course and that nobody ever sees. So here's some examples of student work. So this one example is to make a course website where students focus on disparities in different social issues um, because of uh, climate change or what have you. 
Uh, here's another one on AI and education. And in this one, it was about uh, students, students wrote about disparities in vaccination routes, both because of health coverage, but also because of distrust in the medical establishment. So on this page, they focused on the Tuskegee syphilis study and how the exploitations of African-American by the medical establishment historically has shaped uh, views on newer experimental treatments, such as the COVID vaccine. Uh, so one thing we wanted to look at was, did students feel that they had an opportunity for representational justice with these renewable assignments? That was most definitely a goal that they had. And representational justice is the equitable, equitable opportunities for self-expression by historically underserved and marginalized peoples and groups. Renewable assignments may be designed to provide students with opportunities to create materials that express their identities and tell their stories. This allows for materials about groups to be created by students identifying as members of those groups, for example. Uh, so a measure of representational justice was developed for, for the study by myself and Lindsay Gavash uh, for both renewable and traditional assignments. So students completed items such as these about renewable assignments and then parallel items that just change the wording from renewable to traditional. And before we get, you know, gave them these items, we did explain a little bit what we meant by renewable and traditional. Anyway, as you can see by this graph, students reported notably higher representational justice with renewable compared to traditional assignments. We were also interested in perceptions. So the S in the scope framework was social justice. So put that first. And then perceptions include motivation. So to examine comparisons and motivation, we asked them items related to interest and enjoyment, uh, pressure, choice, competence, relatedness, and as you can see, renewable assignments had higher level of interest and enjoyment, higher levels of choice, competence, rel and relatedness. Um, traditional assignments had higher levels of pressure. So across the board, our findings indicated more motivation for renewable assignments particularly in terms of intrinsic motivation, which is the inherent desire to do something and compared to traditional assignments. So more opportunities for representational justice and more motivation with renewable assignments. We also wanted to look at students who publicly shared versus those who didn't. Remember that they had the option to publicly share. And a reminder that representational justice is equitable opportunities for self-expression by historically underserved and marginalized peoples and groups. So we found that students who publicly shared reported higher levels of representational justice than those who did not. This could be interpreted that students who felt they could express their identities in the renewable assignment wanted to take advantage of an opportunity to share their experiences with others. We were also curious in social justice about recognitive justice, which is recognition and respect for cultural differences in the existing course materials. So we wrote this measure of recognitive justice for the materials in the course. And you can see some sample items on the side. We expected that students who did not see themselves in the course materials may feel that their identities are not respected and may be dissuaded from sharing their renewable assignments. However, from the graph, we can see the reverse is true with students who publicly share their materials reporting lower levels of perceived or cognitive justice in their existing course materials than students who did not publicly share. What we think this may be is that students who perceived that there was a high level for cognitive justice 
may have felt less incentive to share the materials because they felt that the existing materials already had appropriate levels of recognitive justice. Whereas those who didn't think that there was enough for cognitive justice were really wanted to make sure that the materials they developed that were um, equity oriented were shared. We asked students to share some comments about their uh, reasons for public sharing. And here are some examples. Overall, you can see that students felt that they did good work, that they wanted to make sure that their message got shared and um, it was valuable. I uh, was surprised and so, was my so were my colleagues to see somebody write it was a requirement for the class. We checked on that uh, and this was apparently a misunderstanding. It was not required for any of the classes. So this is something that you know we need to be mindful of as instructors that students realize that this is voluntary. And as far as why they didn't, and a lot of it had to do with anxiety and nerves about it, feeling shy or feeling like it wasn't good enough or that it was too personal. And this might be something, you know, it's there, certainly it's within the students' rights not to share, and I don't want to say you have to, but it, it could mean that students would feel more confident about sharing if uh, they, they got feedback saying that it was share worthy. One thing you can do with open educational resources quite smoothly that I have really appreciated as an instructor is social annotation. With social annotation, you put the course materials, the readings, there are also ways to do things like audio or films or um, videos on a shared uh, server of some, some sort. And students share their notes. They put notes on the file and, uh, you know, different than, you know, when we usually take notes while we're reading, only me, the reader, can read them. In this case, my peers can see my notes and I can see my peers' notes. I personally use perusal for this purpose. This is not an endorsement of perusal, just to clarify. I know people who like other social annotation software much more. Perusal happens to be the uh, software that is supported by my institution, so that's what I use. Um, if you use Hypothesis, I am aware that you can publicly share your comments to make it more of a renewable assignment. Uh, this is kind of in the gray area of renewable assignments when it's privately shared because it does have students um, sharing their knowledge with each other and sharing their experiences with each other. But since it's not public and redistributed, it's not quite the full definition of um, what we think of with a renewable assignment. Also, I found out recently uh, when I went to look up a recent article on social annotation that I had published that certain journals actually let you annotate on the journal website. So this is something I am hoping to do in a course at some point. I haven't tried it yet, um, but I'm thinking, you know, for example, the American Psychological Association, all of their journals have this option on there where you can use a hypothesis account and do annotations and then they can be public. You can also have them anonymous and there's different variations of student privacy and such to consider. Um, NDPI journals also allow annotations. But to give you an idea of what perusal looks like, uh, this is not from my class. This is just a um, de-identified example of how it is, but this works very slick with an open educational resource. You upload it, students highlight on an area they find interesting and add comments. Uh, you can upvote it, which is similar to liking or hearting on social media. And you can, students can ask questions. So what I like to do in my classes is uh, I assign this as pre-class reading. And then um, 
I go on after the assignments do that and see what questions they have. And I have almost 70 students, so I don't go through all of their comments, but I can filter it to only see the questions that they ask. And it, it's been a really nice way to have students communicate with me about the course content. They seem a lot more comfortable communicating this way than like coming up during class or raising their hand or even sending me an email. Uh, so last year, I conducted a study on this topic, and I asked students to, to think about their opportunities for representational justice. Did they have an opportunity to speak from their voices and their identities, which is thought to be a main advantage of social annotation. It's a way that students can talk back to the textbook and it flattens the power dynamic because rather the student being here and the textbook being like this huge authority above them, they're encouraged to comment on and relate to the textbook in a way that other people can see. Um, and then because they can share their thoughts and their experiences and they can disagree with the textbook, um, the theory has been that this would allow students opportunity for representational justice because they could express their voices and their identities. Um, and so I did ask students to complete this measure and I found eh, moderately high ratings. Students did not really feel strongly that they agreed with these items, um, but it was above the midpoint. It was significantly above the midpoint of, so above average in terms of representational justice experiences. I also asked students, uh, this was a, based on 42 different students in my class, to think about those items similar to we talked about before. So like, did they feel choice, pressure, competence? Did they feel like they knew how to do it? Relatedness, could they connect to their peers? I want an interest and enjoyment. Ask them to think about social annotation, uh, quizzes, which is another kind of pre-reading assignment that's commonly done by instructors. And to, to also think about um, what individual note taking. So if they would just do the reading on their own and take notes, what were their experiences? And we found overall that students were more motivated to do social annotation than quizzes. That's clear. You can see that very across the board here. So more choice, more feelings of competence, more feelings of relatedness, more interest and enjoyment than quizzes and less pressure than quizzes, even though both quizzes and social annotation were required. With individual notes, students, understandably, were like, I have way more choice because it was never required to do individual notes. So also less, you know, fairly low pressure. They felt competent. Uh, they oddly weren't that low in relatedness, which I thought was funny. Maybe they occasionally share their notes um, without needing to with their peers. And above the same interest and enjoyment as social annotation. All right, I'm just gonna check the chat soon before I go. Okay, I, I see I got a question. I can see how asking students to share assignments might cause anxiety, yes. If they were encouraged to share before or after they received a grade for their assignments. Um, I don't know what those particular faculty members did. You know, we definitely did encourage scaffolding and support. But I imagine if they got a grade before they were encouraged to share or they had to make a decision to share after a grade, they might feel more confident about their decision. So uh, uh, we were relieved though. Um, I didn't share the slide on this because I had to cut something. Uh, Norma, to address your point, we did ask people who publicly shared versus those who didn't about their pressure that they felt during the assignment and those ratings didn't differ. So that was a relief <laughs> because we definitely were worried that students would feel pressured to share, but we didn't see any real difference there. All right, 
memes or other visuals. So I've been told memes are dead, but I've also been told memes are dank still. Like there's still a community of meme lovers or people who like them ironically. Um, I've also found out like memes are still very much alive by having the memes on a video, like showing them individually on a video and reading them aloud. I, you know, my, my 11 year old would watch memes all day if I let her, which I don't. But anyway, the idea is that the, the classic idea of you have an image and a small amount of text and the image and the text work together to share a message um, and into something that's shareable on social media. And what I had students to hear, um, Allison Kelly and I had our students develop memes on psychology content. And uh, for our graduate students, we had them look up research articles to and make memes about them. For our undergraduate students, we gave them materials. And we told them the purpose was there's so much inaccurate information out there. Let's make accurate information that's shareable on social media. Uh, if you're interested in the specific directions or would like to see the article on that, uh, the link is down there. So here's the methodology. Uh, what we were interested in was specifically that public sharing piece. And I have been trained as an experimentalist, meaning I love nothing more than to isolate a variable whenever possible. So what I wanted to do was to isolate whether or not they were publicly shared. So half the students received instructions saying that their memes would be publicly shared. Um, specifically, their instructor was going to post them on what was then Twitter. Um, this is pre-Elon. And half of them were not given any information about pu public sharing. And we had students create the memes, they got peer review of the memes uh, and then submitted their final versions and then were asked to complete a questionnaire of motivation. And we had 74 students complete the questionnaire. And we asked them about two kinds of value related to motivation. So intrinsic is things that are inherently enjoyable or interesting or fun. Utility is this will apply to my life or my goals, either my personal goals or my professional goals. Um, and the last one there, the meme project was pointless. That was reverse scored. And what we found was when we compared students who had their memes publicly shared, you know, after they turned it in, they got a grade saying, you know, you know, here's your grade. And if you want to see, go to my Twitter handle to find, to see the post. And students were told, if you don't want it shared, let us know. You can email me and I won't share it. Um, no students for either my classes or Dr. Kelly's classes opted not to share. Um, and we found that as far as both intrinsic value and utility value, they were very similar. We had thought students might find that if they knew it was going to be shared on social media, the utility value would be higher because it would have more of a informational role. It'd be more useful, but we didn't find that. Uh, as far as emotional cost, we, we were concerned that students would have that anxiety and those kinds of concerns. And we found out um, actually those ratings were really low. Overall, any questions about being worried or um, emotionally unpleasant or stress or anxiety, the ratings were pretty low. And that was for both public and not public sharing, which kind of surprised me. And to clarify, I did post the memes anonymously without, well, I mean, my name was on them. And I said these were my students, but I did not have any identifying information about the students. <clears throat> Just to address uh, Abby, what you commented there. Uh, when we asked students to evaluate the skills they developed, 
So think about your communication skills and how much did you learn about scientific knowledge? We found that students in the public sharing community groups did report higher ratings. However, the other ratings overall were pretty similar. So we're not sure if they actually felt more development of these skills or if this is just a coincidence. Yes, you know, so what we call a spurious finding where there's a difference and it's just by chance. And then academic emotions we were also concerned about, you know, thinking about, um, you know, confidence and nervousness and pride and embarrassment. And we're happy to see overall students had pretty high ratings of confidence and pride. So they felt good about the work they did uh, and pretty low re ratings of unpleasant emotions such as feeling uneasy or embarrassed. Uh, we were surprised to see that those who were in the groups that were not public reported higher levels of pride and higher levels of confidence. Again, because we've seen overall, for the most part, there weren't differences. We, we were pretty suspicious of this um, because we had thought actually that knowing that other people would see it would make you more proud. Um, I, we could understand a confidence difference because you might feel a little hit to your confidence, but the fact that there isn't a difference for uneasy or embarrassed makes us think that maybe this just was a coincidence. We didn't have any kind of pretest that we could do with this. So as far as our take home points, overall, we found students thought making memes was enjoyable and valuable. And this is something that could be applied to any other kind of shareable content on social media. So um, Allison has now developed this assignment to be infographics that are shared on Instagram. Um, I know other instructors who have their students make short video reels or TikToks. Um, I did adapt it because I gave students the option of making a video or an audio assignment. I only had one student actually do that. But generally speaking, students like this creative approach to learning about research. Um, low emotional costs. We did see more pride without public sharing, which doesn't really make sense. And it's possible, but we acknowledge the, the genuine likelihood that it's due from chance that public sharing did benefit communication and scientific knowledge perceived skills. Right. Another idea for how you can use open education in your course is to have your students take photos of course content or of students responding before or after the public posting. Um, I encourage them to look on my Twitter feed to see what had been posted or comments, but they did respond to the survey before the posting. So I don't know how many of them actually did. And there were a few comments on Twitter, but I was actually a little disappointed. I was hoping people would comment more, engage more with them. Um, having students take photos is another option for open pedagogical practices. So thinking back to those textbooks and the lack of diversity, uh, my colleague Ashley Biddle at um, who works through the University of Hawaii system at a community college, Leeward Community College. She had her students go through and code the diversity based on the presenting identities in terms of being looking like they're men or women uh, or you know, the perceived race based on the photographs. And they found that overwhelmingly the photographs in their course textbook, which was an open textbook on introduction to psychology, uh, it was overwhelmingly white men. So she asked her students who had very diverse backgrounds. They were um, mostly uh, Native Hawaiian or Asian or Hispanic. She asked them to take photographs related to the course content. And then she asked them to creatively comments, creative comments, license them and share and then the ultimate goal is to edit and update the textbook with the photographs and share for distribution. So she asked her students to comment on their experiences with this. 
And based on the survey responses, she she found that students were very much motivated to contribute to an open textbook. Like that seemed, that was reported as something they wanted to do. They had some concerns about public availability, but it was about moderate. It wasn't super high or super low. They did think the project made the course more engaging. They felt that they had more perceived educational value having done this experience, that they got more out of the course than they would have without the experience. And they believed that their photos added to the diversity of publicly available materials. Uh, this is upcoming in the citation below. And uh, Ashley asked her students to comment, like, why do you think we did this project? So she had the students code for diversity and then do the photographs. Um, and she found that generally speaking, students had a pretty good understanding that they there's of what the purpose was. They're really thinking about photos now that they're sharing them, they're putting more thought and planning into them. Um, she's students were reflecting about what's missing from the textbook and how that relates to the pictures they'll take. Um, she really thought the class as a whole did a great job as far as diverse photos and it would make the textbook feel more personal and relatable and that students were better able to connect knowing that the photos that they were taking would be going into a new version of the textbook. And uh, when the students had this particularly powerful awareness that there was a lack of diversity in the textbook, and with this project, we're attempting to increase that diversity. Um, I'll mention one more kind of open pedagogy right now. The only research I know about is uh, the work I am in progress. Currently, I have um, collaborated with an instructor in a nutrition course. And this term, she's going to have her students write textbook question or write exam questions as a way to review the material. Um, and then those questions will then be used, um, selected ones will be on the final exam. And we're going to compare uh, the exam scores, the unit exam scores to previous semesters where she didn't have students write the multiple choice questions to see how this activity helps students understand the material, and if uh, knowing that the questions they write are going to be used, um, if that changed their engagement at all. All right. I, well, I put up a, a Mentimeter, ask me everything, anything, but um, I think with the size of what we have, I will just show this last slide and open it up. So uh, if you have questions, you know, other than chatting with me now, um, you can find me on these various social media platforms. I'm still technically on Twitter, but I really don't check it much. And this again is that faculty guide to renewable assignments. Uh, and I just wanted to thank my colleagues, Lindsay Gavash, Heather Michelli, and Will Cross for sharing the examples and materials that I provided in this presentation. Thank you very much, Virginia. It's great to have you today. Uh, yeah. You've provided so many things for people to think about just in terms of from the very basics of why open education, how do OER work all the way up to these more applied principles of open pedagogy. Uh, for those who are wondering why Virginia today, I think it's really impressive the amount of research that you've done on open educational practices, uh, because a lot of people will do this work and they just say, well, if, I'm teaching. Of course, I'm going to teach. I'm going to do these things that are the best for my students. But having the data to back up why we're doing this and how it's impacting students really helps when making the case to administrators that we're doing something important. And it can also be really useful in those tenure and promotion discussions as well to say, I'm not just doing this because it's a feel good thing, but also because it's improving students connection to their course and their materials. Mm -hmm. so. And here's the evidence. Oh, okay, this Julia. Is so, <laughs> this is so fascinating. I'm just trying to wrap my head around um, how I could utilize some of these things. And I'm, I'm interested into digging in a little more. Um, I'm doing an advanced social policy, essentially class this coming semester. 
and um, the two major projects in there to support the learning outcomes for the course are going to be students crafting um, voter registration campaigns to propose to their social work agencies. Uh, and then the other one is um, doing a back of the envelope, thinking through how they would run for office um, mm -hmm. in their communities. And so I'm just trying to think about this because one of the things I'm finding as I'm looking for OER resources, even on just plain civics, is that it's really hard. So um, to find something that I think is mm, worthwhile, um, but I'm, I've got some ideas now about how we might work together to create um, part of the, the book about like, I'm thinking about like, you know, what are the most local offices that you can run for? You know, what does it take to get on the zoning board? What does it take to get on the parks and rec board, right? Those kinds of things that are often overlooked um, and are very, very important in communities. So I appreciate what you're offering here. And I put the link to the um, faculty guide I put together in the chat, you know, what you're talking about might be something that could be developed into like a course website project or something to that effect. So that, you know, as far as the like how to run for office guide for um, people to be on your course to be able to use. And the campaigns for uh, voting are really interesting as well. I think there's a couple of ways that people have done these sorts of projects where it's not necessarily an OER at the end of the day, but it becomes something useful for students to implement. Uh, Rajiv Jangani that Virginia mentioned at the end has done one where students write op-eds and then they send it to their local newspaper and see if it can get accepted as a piece in the newspaper. So it's a way to also get their work out there and get a publication under their belt before they graduate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just um, anecdotally, I found that getting my reluctant writer to write, I had her write reviews of local businesses online. And that's not an OER, but it is publicly available and valuable for the business. So. I have a question about conducting open education research uh, with classes with students you're teaching. Yeah. Are you doing this, you know, just thinking about the IRB? Uh, yes, I'm doing and, it right now. And all of that. Yeah. So how, like, how does that work um, with mm -hmm. protection of students? Yep. There are a few different safeguards that I put into place. You know, one is that students always have the option to not have their data be used. And they, um, so you would, you know, I tell them in class, um, if it's a face-to-face -face class, and that is also the information sheet, if you don't want me to use your grades on these assignments, just email me and let me know, and I'll, I'll withdraw your data. Like, that's no problem whatsoever. Um, I always, ha I have some boilerplate plate language about how um, participating in this survey will not affect your relationship with me or your grade in the course. If you want to get the extra credit points I'm offering, for completing the survey, you can do this other assignment that takes about the same amount of time. Um, I do tell students, you know, I, I'm doing this research because I want to see if what I'm doing in the class is actually helping you. Like, I don't want to keep doing things that, you know, heaven forbid, actually cause harm. So that there is that, that trade-off. And um, this term I've put I've implemented my most, I don't know, invasive, it's the right word, but it's the most obvious research study. Like before it's been a little more subtle, like they're put into groups, but it's not a really dramatic difference. Um, and it's hidden on Blackboard as far as which group they were in or not in. Um, so they're not, the odds that they'd be really aware that they're in an experimental design um, or really notice that their peers are getting something that you're, they're not. Um, it, it wasn't a super obvious thing other than being asked to do the survey. Um, but I am having students for part of the term, one group is doing quizzes and one group is doing social annotations. And then for the next part of the term, they're swapping. So this is a crossover experimental design. 
Um, so they're very much aware that this is a research study and I've told them what's going on um, and explained why I'm doing this. And they seem like, oh, well, that's cool. Like they actually were kind of like, oh, like you care enough about your teaching to do this extra work. So that was the general feedback I got from them. Um, they didn't seem irritated, like, well, how come they're doing, have to, I have to do a quiz and they get to do annotations. That's not, you know, I haven't gotten any of that attitude or any of that concerns. So I'm like, well, cause, and I did say, I genuinely don't know which one's better. That's why I'm doing this study. Um, and as far as IRB, you use that language in the consent form, the opportunity to withdraw their grades and their alternative opportunities for an, any extra credit. Uh, finally, any surveys or anything like that, do not look at the data uh, until grades are entered. That's a standard thing I have in my IRB and I tell my class, I will not look at your responses until after grades are entered. Um, I have a peer who is also in my, that I add to my IRB. I um, go look at the survey to let me know who responded so I can award extra credit. Well, thank you again. Do we have any final questions or comments for Virginia about today before she heads out? Here's your last chance. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, I just want to say, everyone, we're going to take a 15-minute break so you can run to the restroom, get a snack, start your lunch if you need to. And then when we come back, we're going to do some introductions, team building, and discussions of your scheduling for communities of practice throughout the rest of the fall. So thank you for coming out today. And thank you, Virginia, for giving us this excellent presentation about your work. Thank you for inviting me. Have a good day.